Thank you. Uh, my name is Nemanja, like Miroslav said. Uh, I work for Brisk. It's a London-based company which deals with delivery, delivery logistics. And today we are going to talk about change detection in JavaScript frameworks. Uh, once more reminder, go to Slido, hashtag Armada.js. Feel free to post a question and if there is some time at the end, I will be more than glad to answer them. Okay, today uh, we are going to cover some of the popular frameworks like Angular, both versions, Backbone, React, Vue, both versions, and Svelte, the new hope in JS frameworks. So the first one, Backbone, it started in 2010. Uh, current is it's at version 1.4. At the beginning, some of big names uh, developed their applications in Backbone, but later on, most of them switched to something newer. Most of them mm, switched to React. And I found one which is still on Backbone. It's called Newsblur. I'm mentioning it because I'm using it to read the news. I recommend it. So basically how Backbone works. Uh, our state is kept in a model. Uh, we have to update the state using a set method. State uh, uh, actual model when it retrieves, uh, retrie uh, ge gets a payload for the update, it checks what's what's updated and publishes events about the updates. Uh, view, who has reference to the state, uh, to, to the model, actually listens to those updates and should update the UI. Uh, it looks something like this. We have our model. These nodes are actually properties in the model. Uh, when we called model.set and set a new state, one of the properties is, for example, updated and it publishes the event. We should update, uh, at that point, we should update the UI, and it's up to us how we are going to do it. There is a link to the great post. Uh, I stole an image from that, from that post, so feel free to go and check the entire post over there. Uh, this is just an example how some uh, simple application looks in a uh, backbone. Uh, we have our, we have, at the beginning we have a model, we pass some default properties to it, or attribute, attributes, how they call it, we initiate the model, uh, we have a view, and at the end we initialize the view and gives it, gives the model which we view use to uh, present the data. In the view we just give him the reference to the element where view should be rendered. We have some initialized method where we call the initial render and subscribe to the events, uh, uh, to the changes on the model. And we have a render function in which one we actually uh, read the properties for our from the model, put them in a template, and that's basically it. At the end we just update the entire HTML in the element we have mentioned here. Yeah. Uh, so basically what happens when we call model set and pass some payload or data we want to update? Um, model actually goes through each of the attributes and checks if its current value that that's in the model is different than the past value push all those uh, changes into array, publishes custom event for each change property, and in the end publishes general event that something has changed in the model. Uh, view has to listen to, to this change event, and this is naive approach, uh, re-render the entire view. So let's just briefly check, yeah, it's fine. This is the same application. Uh, we are just have that model. We have view listener, like we saw on the on the slides. And at the end, we have just simple timeout function, which after three seconds update the property 
uh, in a model and that should trigger the model change and view should be re-rendered. Let us refresh, first name John, after three seconds it gets the new name. And not, nothing special about it. So um, if you want to add some more interactivity to this, let's just uh, bind, some, uh, bind some events. For example, uh, let's just say we are listening to key up on this input uh, and on each input we just set the first name uh, on a in a model. And this happens. It sets the name, but it clears the input because uh, it actually renders the entire view. So how we can make it better? We can not, not doing the complete re-rendering of the view, but let's just update, select the div. This is, this dollar sign is actually, I'm not sure if you can see it. This dollar sign is actually a jQuery reference scoped to the element scope. Uh, we just find the div, update its content, and set the value of the input to the same uh, value from the, from the model. Okay, and just let's do one more thing. Let's update not to com complete change event, but just for the event for the first name and call update first name in this one. Yeah, and that works. Okay, let's get back to the slides. Mm. So, like like so it, it requires some additional work to make it to work nicely and the complete uh, rendering of the view is done on our side now uh, let's go to the angular js also known as angular one uh, it's also from 2010 current version is 1.7.8 uh, I couldn't find any famous public applications that are written in uh, Angular, maybe Forbes website and GitHub co community actually using it. But those are, other are less familiar, uh, except Upwork. So uh, on the left hand side, we saw something that that's uh, happened in the backbone. It's uh, one way binding, but Angular does a better thing. It does two way data binding, actually, it compiles the template, creates the view, uh, it has a model, uh, change the model uh, when view updates and change the view when model updates. So uh, in this case we don't have like a model and state in a model, we have something called scope. In Angular that is actually the place where we keep the state. Uh, when, when we have a controller it has own context which is called scope and that is at the same time its state we just assign values to that uh, to that scope and we can access them in a controller just by mentioning the name of the property because the its scope uh, to the controller uh, basically what what happens when angular tries to uh, compile the template uh, it actually goes through the template and take each expression. For example, this is the first name, last name. And in the scope, we already saw that we have a first name and last name. And we have something called watchers that is an array. It contains uh, a watcher for each expression mentioned in the template. That watcher has, has a function uh, which actually use is used to update the DOM. We have getter, that is function which is called for that watcher to get value from the scope. In, in the first case it gets the value for the first name, in the second one from the last name. And this last property uh, keeps the last value that that property had, so it can compare the values, the new one and the last one, and if they are different than updates the DOM, if they are the same, does nothing. So it looks something like this. We have uh, our DOM, we have our ex 
the, those rectangles are actually some expressions. They are all bind to some properties in the uh, models. And when something is changed, uh, that expression reads the value from the model. Uh, we have to be aware about two main concepts in uh, Angular. It's apply. Because Angular is framework, it does everything for us. And if we are using it, we don't have to bother about when and how is something going to be updated. But if we are using some uh, other library outside of uh, Angular, for example, Axios to get some uh, data from the server, then we have to explicitly call apply in order if even we have changed the, the properties in the scope, we have to call the apply so Angular co can go through them and check if something is changed. Uh, this change detection is done in digest cycle. Digest cycle is actually a loop which goes through all the watchers we have in a scope, evaluates them, check, check the value. I if it's different than uh, the old value, it updates the DOM and goes the entire cycle again. Because we can have like uh, our own uh, watchers attached to the uh, scope and we can change some other values in the scope. So if some value is changed, when watcher uh, fires, we can change other values. So in that cycle, uh, we have changed some value. Angular has to go one more cycle to detect this another change. S this way, mm, that's disadvantage of Angular we have ended up, end up in infinitive loop. But Angular handles that by limiting those cycles to 10. And everyone who worked with Angular must have seen this message at least once. Uh, actually, what Digest Cycle does, how it's triggered actually, uh, it's called when we use some. This ng click is actually attribute that uh, Angular uses to bind an event to an element. And once that handler is finished, Angular just starts the digest cycle to check what has what's potentially changed in that callback for for the event. Like we can uh, then it tracks intervals. It tracks tracks uh, timeouts, uh, server, uh, and apply or just call that, which is manually called. It's, uh, scopes are like, if you have more components in, in our application, then scopes are like three of uh, uh, scopes per component. It Angular starts from the root scope, which the one that has no parent, goes through all the watchers uh, all the way down and if it detects that any value is changed, it goes in another round and updates the UI, UI at the end. This is not completely accurate because the last time I did some debugging, it actually updated the state at the moment uh, uh, watcher detected uh, difference between values maybe they have changed it in, uh, in the meantime. I'm not sure at which point the, this this uh, image was made. So uh, this is a little bit of source code. It is just the digest cycle. It is like a heart of the Angular. At the beginning of it, it's, it's actually doing do-while uh, loop. At the beginning, it sets uh, scope to not dirty, it means that it has no changes in it. Then goes through the each watcher of the watchers, uh, gets the value, uh, compare it to the last value from the watch. If it's different, pronounces the this cycle as a dirty, uh, calls the function from the watch with which actually updates the DOM. And then takes uh, uh, another uh, another scope and goes further. This is like a protection. I, I mentioned TTL is time to live. It's set to 10. When you reach 10 dirty cycles, it will just rise an error. 
So, how digest cycle is triggered? Like I said, we have special uh, attributes, prefix with ng hyphen, where we can call our functions, etc. Uh, then we have some uh, APIs we can use. It's like HTTP interval timeout. It, it actually does the same thing as regular interval, but with one difference. It's set timeout wrapper, which calls scope apply at the end, and we can call scope apply manually. This is what actually scope apply do. It just evolved the expression if we have passed some callback function. And here, finally, it calls scope digest. This is the place where the check of the entire application starts and goes into at least one cycle. Let us quickly check the example. OK. This is the app. It, it's simple. And we are doing this with actually a few lines of code. Uh, you saw what we had to do in a backbone to accomplish, accomplish this. Uh, so let's go on. Uh, I'm skipping a few of them because these two are connected. Angular 2 or just Angular or Angular version number is a new version of uh, Angular. Current version is 8.2.7. Again, I tried to find some publicly known applications which uses this, this framework. Microsoft Office uh, uses it. Interesting. Freelancer's website Clockify, it's a time tracking app made by the company Novisad. Check it out. And Ryanair. So this is basically some simple <coughs> example. Uh, Angular uses TypeScript, so we have some uh, component defined. Uh, selector is basically the name of the HTML tag where the component will be rendered. Uh, we have our uh, we have template, CSS, and this is the simple component template. Ex ex again, we have some expressions. We have ng model which does double uh, two-way binding. We have click handle. Uh, nothing special about this one. Uh, the biggest difference uh, about the Angular 1 and 2 is how changes happens in in uh, application. Angular 1 graph looks like this because of the custom watchers, for example. Uh, because in in any component, in any depth, we, ca we have access to, let's say, root scope. We can access those properties because uh, our component somewhere deeply has reference to the root scope. We can set a watcher to some of the root scope uh, properties. And in that watcher, when that property update, updates some other property also in a root scope, that's, that's why it's shown like changes can go up and something like that. It's really chaotic and that's why Angular has to go all the way around in the cycles to check what's happened because I changes can happen everywhere. In Angular 2, they have changed it. They have like a straight tree graph. Changes always go from top to down. So this is uh, how change detection is done. We just saw this is digest cycle, which gets the value, compares and <coughs> updates the DOM. And this is, yeah, this this is this is fine. It evaluates that get every time, in every iteration, and that is something that uh, JavaScript doesn't like. It can't optimize that in very efficient way when it runs it. In Angular, uh, during the bootstrapping of the application, uh, each component gets an another class attached to it. It's called component change detector. And it implements a method detect changes. And it actually uses the properties from the template and checks them uh, 
like directly accessing the property. Uh, this is something that JavaScript likes and can optimize it and be very efficient about running this code. I, of course, it doesn't look like this and it is available only in runtime and it's barely readable. But you can actually find the names of your variables I in it. So how the change detection is done in Angular? Uh, so we have three components. CD represents a uh, change detector of each component. Uh, changes are checked from top to down. So it requires some kind of a tick or pull signal to start uh, detecting changes. And it goes all the way down through the tree. So <coughs> this tick method actually goes through the each view and call detect changes. It calls that change detector which detect the changes if something is changed updates. And it goes only uh, only one cycle. So it is basically the digest cycle but only one run. In Angular in Angular uh, one with one single change you will definitely have to digest cycle because the second one is going to check if some of the watchers maybe change something when they fired. Uh, Angular tends to be more performant and they have introduced something called uh, change detection strategy on push. Uh, it, it works like that. Bec uh, it says that the component will be updated only if the component's inputs are updated because we can pass inputs to the components and if something happened in the tree below. It basically means that almost the same thing as should component update from React. So what triggers the tr uh, change detection? Who triggers that tick? We have something called zone.js. Uh, this is the quote from the Victor Savkin from the Algor core team. Zone.js was primarily developed like to measure time, how, how fast something executes, something like that. So what zone JS actually do, does. It basically m does a monkey patching in a runtime. That means that before uh, Angular application starts, uh, it goes through the web APIs and patch them in a way like this. Uh, it saves the reference to the original, for example, set timeout function, defines a new one. So he can Zone JS can know uh, if we have set timeout anywhere in our application. After the tim timeout expires, it calls. Of course, it calls your callback, and knows that the callback timeout has been fired. The same way it patches. Uh, this is patches event target. That's anything that can have listener attached to it. Knows that we have attached the listener fires the listener uh, when I it should be fired and knows that the listener uh, has been fired. So we have simple code like um, we have a button attached, uh, click, li click listener to it, uh, nothing special, just comes a log when it's clicked and we have some ti uh, set timeout function which will expire in three, three seconds. Actually the console log looks like this. Uh, at the beginning when at the moment when we attach the event listener, it can do something. In this case, it just uh, prints out, I know that you have a, a attached uh, event listener. When it, I know that you have started a timeout. When timeout expired, it knows that timeout is expired and so on. So it actually patches all those events. This is not the complete list and patches the web APIs, this is also not the, the, the complete list. It treats them inside the 
zone as micro and macro tasks uh, that's imported for, for the event loop. And an Angular uh, actually has ng zone, which is a wrapper around the, the zone, which does a simple thing. Once all tasks are done, uh, that means that we have gathered all the running tasks and we actually know when something is done, when all of the tasks are done. It just triggers the tick, which goes and does the change detection on the entire tree. Okay, um, let's go to the next one. It's React from 2013, current version 16.9. It's used, of course, by Facebook, Instagram, Netflix, Airbnb, you just name it. Uh, this is a simple application. It just uh, extends React component. It and the state is kept in the state property of the component. We define some properties. We have a render method, which uses that state uh, in, a, in a template. And it bootstrapping of the application <laughs> is not important here. Uh, it actually can, besides state, it can receive props and it can render props. Uh, interesting thing about uh, React, it uses JSX syntax, which actually uh, creates uh, React create, that is a lot of React create uh, element functions, which actually creates a virtual DOM elements because mm, React is using a virtual DOM. It works something like this. We have a model from which we create a virtual DOM and based on virtual DOM, we render the actual DOM. Uh, so how we can change data in, in uh, React in, in order to trigger re-rendering? We can, of course, set state. And we can pass some props to the child and that props change will re-render the child component. Nothing special about this. But we'll, uh, but we'll uh, just call re-render. Uh, this is the maybe heart of the React, I this reconciliation algorithm. I each time uh, something is changed, the set is changed, React re-renders everything, re-renders the world. So uh, I it has some ways to optimize it but it's it's really fast so at the at the top we have the old tree something has changed the red and it creates the new tree it's down there it knows how to reuse some of the components if they are not changed and uh, renders up updates the change component so it does not it not just flushes the new uh, virtual DOM to, to the application because it's expensive, because the uh, browser has to re-render everything from the beginning. It actually finds a, a diff, difference between uh, those two virtual DOMs and patches just what's necessary. And it's really efficient in doing this. Uh, Redux is most famous way or state container to keep our state in, in React. It's not mentioned to be used just in React. It can be used in any other, other application. Uh, the main idea is to have uh, one place of truth, one place when we where we store data, not to have uh, lo local states in the components. Of course, we can have local states states in a component. Basically, if we have some kind of a forms, we want just temporary to keep data in the form before sending them to the server. But in all other situations, uh, this is the best approach proven. Uh, so UI is updated from the store. When user clicks on something, it actually sends some kind of a change to store. Reducer 
like pack that's that payload in a proper way and keeps it in the store and that change updates the UI. Uh, why this is good approach? Because le let's say we have one this component and we need something from from that component in all uh, all in some other components. We can't say data in the other direction, we can send events. Then this event maybe updates its own state, this uh, propagates uh, the changes to its child component, etc. Uh, we we uh, redux this component will update only one single point of truth where the data is, it's, it's store, and all other components basically listens to to this uh, to this property and can uh, action accordingly. Uh, one more thing: why uh, React is so efficient in uh, creating a virtual DOM is because of Im immutability. When something is changed, it can easily know if tree has to be re-rendered because if you are using immutable uh, references that means that each time you change something you need to refer to return a new object and the reference is changed okay that, that was all about the the react now we are going to view we are going to cover view one and two basically the main difference is that you the first version updates the DOM directly and the second version is using a virtual DOM like React. Of course it's used by Vizier, Vivify Scrum, it's a agile tool developed by a company in Novi Sad, so please check it out. Livestone webinar app and so on. There is a link where you can find more of applications made in view current version is 2.6 and I saw that uh, Ian View, Ian Yu who is the actually the creator of the view yesterday had a talk announcing uh, view 3.0 this is the simple view application uh, we keep our state in data property it has to we have to define all the properties up front we will see why we can define some methods with change the property in the same way in Angular 1. We don't have set method or anything, we just change it. And we have some something called computed properties which, which are updated each time any of the properties they are using is uh, updated. And uh, at the end we have templates, same as for the other examples, just first name, last name and some event handlers, nothing special about it. Uh, one more interesting thing about view, it actually can be written in a single component file uh, with extension view. Of course you need a compiler if you are going to write components in this way. And it has like separation, you, you define template section in, in the same file, script section and style. Styles can be scoped, <coughs> so it their CSS will be, their styling will be applied only to this component. It's done by giving uh, uh, some random number to the classes in a template and uh, adding class to the p p selector in the in the style so uh, what view actually does just a second okay sorry it takes the template parse it, optimize it, and does a code generation. Parsing actually tries to, f to find all the expressions used uh, in a template. Uh, optimizer is actually, when uses, uh, when parser creates like a tree of uh, our HTML, optimizer goes through all the nodes that are going to be created, finds those which are static nodes, like div with text in it, there is no expression, creates a st 
like static version of a node and hoist it to the top, in it will not be checked anymore. CodeGAN just creates a function which will take take the state and update the the the, the node. Uh, everything that creates render functions, and those render functions uh, creates V nodes. That's actually virtual node from the virtual DOM. This is for Angular uh, View 2.0. Okay. Uh, so how changes are tracked in 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 View? Um, I have put the numbers so we can figure out. This is actually the from the views website. At the beginning, it it takes our data property data property from the view component that is the place where we keep our state and for each property in in a in a state defines getter and setter so it can track when someone access this the property in the state and sets the property in the state so let, let's go to two component render function at the moment when the virtual dom is rendered when DOM is rendered, that function from the compiler tries to access the, st the state and to read the value in order to fill the expression from the template. Uh, in that point, uh, view figures out that that property is touched and each component has something called watcher attached to it. It just collects all those functions that were accessing some of the some of the uh, properties. These functions are actually renderers. And when and that's done, and the, the application is bootstrapped and running. Once someone uh, sets the property, either by setting it uh, with a handler or timeout function, uh, getting it from the whatever. It notifies the watcher that this property is accessed, changed actually, and the watcher goes through all the render functions that actually accessed previously, accessed that property, and calls the render, calls that function so they have they can update the DOM. It actually helps like this. Uh, we have properties converts into getters and setters. Uh, once this is notified when someone sets the new property, it notifies the watchers. Uh, all the watchers are not <laughs> called immediately, those functions which update the DOM, but they are just pushed into the queue. So if we if a lot of uh, those properties are that are updated in the various places, we want to <coughs> gather them together. Maybe some properties uh, accessed multiple times by the same component, so we will render it just once. And we render it on the next tick. Uh, next tick is something important for the event loop. Uh, uh, Vue tries to use promise.dat because it will push this flush this <coughs> this render functions into micro stack queue uh, if you're familiar with the event loop it will make sense or if it fails it just sets timeout and push the rendering at the moment when it's available in in a uh, queue okay uh, and we are getting to the svelte it's a new framework. Uh, <coughs> actually, there is a 3.0 version currently. <coughs> it's component framework. It's actually a compiler. Uh, it runs in, in <coughs> runtime and converts, converts our components in imperative code. And they take here to update the DOM in very precise way and most efficient way. Frame frameworks we have seen, they have declarative <coughs> uh, defining of uh, properties and behavior. 
and we have to compile it before uh, anything <coughs> runs actually. And in case of uh, React or uh, Vue, we have to do some diffing or go through the entire tr through the entire uh, tree of the components to detect the changes. So Svelte looks something like this. Okay, they have some banner about the climate changing. I'll just remove it. Uh, This is an example how Svelte component looks like. Let me just try to zoom, zoom in. Okay. Uh, it actually has something like dot view. It, you have separate parts where you can put your scripts uh, and uh, template in it. It doesn't have concept of a state or something like that. Uh, we just define a value, define a handler. Uh, bind them to the to the button, and we have some expressions so that to to print them out. So in the frameworks we have seen before, uh, this will be this will require a compiler in a runtime, uh, and some way some way of signal or a function to trigger the the re-rendering, and everything will be checked for for the for the change course this works and this is the output of this code actually it's it's readable in some kind of way this is uh, actually Svelte extends Svelte component it compiles into this this file actually it calls in it <coughs> has some functions you can we can go through each of them, but there is it's not make sense right now. Uh, create fragment actually is used to create element, and we see that we are using this context is actually this function uh, where we have a count which we are defined in the component click handle, and we have invalidate. This is actually pushing the. Uh update function into the micro task queue. We just uh, export uh, or return count and uh, hand click and we use it here as a context. Uh, we are exactly using those values. This is very convenient for, for the JavaScript compiler. It can run it fast. We create the elements uh, from the context uh, attach listeners, append it to the DOM, and this is actually the function which changes, we tracks the changes. When changes happen, it checks the count, set the data, and sets the, the value for, for that text. Is it going to be time or times? Now, if we, if we just try to use something like this, It will be almost ignored. It will not appear here or anywhere else. We will have it uh, uh, like generated, but it's not used anywhere. So Svelte is aware, compiler is aware that this value shouldn't appear anywhere in, in, in the uh, component that's generated. But if we use it, Let's say just print it out here. Uh, we will have it here, just when the node is created. Uh, DOM is created, and in change function, it's completely ignored because it's aware that we we did not change it anywhere. That's some, of course, it has, uh, you can check it out, it has a lot of more interesting features and in how it's done. For example, because it's compiler, it can be compiled to anything and we can compile it to server-side rendering, for example. Um, okay, thank you, Th that would be all. Unfortunately, I think we don't have time for questions. If